So now let's talk about the CRISPR-Cas9 system that really revolutionized the gene editing world. So the remainder of this lecture will focus on uh, mainly CRISPR-Cas9. So we'll talk about kind of the mechanism that it uses to generate uh, double-stranded DNA breaks, uh, as well as the two pathways that uh, we can use to repair those uh, double-stranded breaks, as well as introduce the uh, target mutation. And we'll also discuss uh, alternative uses for CRISPR-Cas9 beyond just genome editing. So it is pretty actively used for doing things like gene activation or repression, uh, epigenetic modification, or even things like imaging. Um, and so we'll discuss briefly how, how CRISPR-Cas9 can be repurposed for those, for those tasks. So CRISPR-Cas9 is actually a bacterial defense system uh, that almost all archaea and about half of bacteria that are known anyways use as part of their adaptive immune systems. Um, and so the purpose of CRISPR-Cas9 is really to protect cells against viruses and other foreign DNA. And so it's important to note that today we'll mainly talk about class two CRISPR-Cas systems, uh, where basically they're characterized by having a single main effector Cas protein, in this case, Cas9. Um, and it's worth noting that class one systems are actually more prevalent uh, in nature. So about 90% of CRISPR-Cas loci across bacteria and archaea are of class one. Um, and what and what the distinguishing factor or distinguishing feature about class one systems is that they're characterized by having multiple Cas effector proteins. Um, also, the other main distinguish, distinguishing feature that class two systems also mainly just target DNA, whereas class one systems uh, target both like DNA and RNA, for example. Um, and so in the endogenous CRISPR Cas9 systems, there's basically two phases to bacterial immunity. Uh, in the immunization phase, uh, basically the idea here is that uh, upon infection of a cell uh, with viral DNA, uh, basically the Cas complex, which is mainly composed of Cas1 and 2, uh, basically recognize the viral DNA and cleave it. Right? And so after cleaving it, you end up with the original viral genome that's cut up into these little smaller chunks. And so uh, the Cas complex basically takes these small chunks, which are called spacers, and incorporate them into the host genome. And so one key point here is that the spacers are not, uh, the viral genome is not incorporated into the host genome as is, basically by chopping up the spacers uh, and basically putting repeat sequences between them, uh, you can basically store pieces or signatures of the original viral DNA without actually storing the, uh, the original viral DNA as a whole. Uh, in the host genome. And so in the immunity phase, uh, what happens is that the bacteria basically looks at this stored locus, this stored information, and uses it to defend against uh, basically the same pathogen uh, invading the cell. Uh, and how they do this is they basically start by transcribing the CRISPR locus. Right? And so when you transcribe both you know, the combination of repeats and spacers, you produce what's known as the pre-CRISPR RNA. And so again, your pre-CRISPR RNA con contains basically a series of uh, spacer molecules separated by the repeats. And so what happens is a separate tracer RNA, uh, which is uh, encoded uh, in a different part of the CRISPR locus, is also transcribed. And what happens is these, uh, these tracer RNAs basically go and they hybridize to the repeat regions on the pre-CRISPR RNA. And so what happens then is once the tracer RNA hybridizes to the pre-CRISPR RNA, uh, RNA 3 basically comes along and it, it basically chops up or cleaves the CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA complexes so that instead of one giant pre-CRISPR uh, RNA, now you have a bunch of, uh, you have a bunch of different complexes where you have one tracer RNA uh, bound to or hybridized to one uh, repeat region, which is also attached to one spacer. Um, and so those are uh, basically after Cas9 uh, also co-complexes with uh, your tracer RNA and CRISPR RNA. Uh, what you end up with is what's called the mature CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA, Cas9 complex. And so again, this mature complex consists of um, one tracer RNA, 
one Cas9 complex and one uh, basically effectively a spacer uh, from the original viral genome. And so what happens is that the spacer basically, um, the, the com you know, this mature complex basically uses the spacer to guide the Cas9 uh, protein with its nuclease and it basically searches and finds the viral DNA and then it'll cut the viral DNA. And so an important thing to point out here is that um, it only cuts the viral DNA if it also finds what's called the PAM sequence on the viral DNA. And so PAM sequence is basically supposed to be a sequence that is on the viral genome, but is not on the host genome. And so that's how CRISPR-Cas9 uh, knows to cut the viral genome that it binds to and not cut the uh, host genome where the spacers are stored. And so uh, when CRISPR-Cas9 was is repurposed for the purposes of genome editing, basically one of the uh, one of the changes that's made is basically instead of having instead of having these separate uh, CRISPR RNAs, which contain essentially the spacer or the guide, uh, the guide sequence, which you know helps you search out the target. Uh, instead of having like a separate CRISPR RNA and a separate tracer RNA that then has to co-complex or hybridize to each other and then uh, be bound by Cas9, basically in genome editing systems, uh, the CRISPR RNA and the tracer RNA are actually designed as a single uh, RNA molecule. And that single RNA molecule is what's called the guide RNA. So just to say that again, the guide RNA that people talk about when it comes to CRISPR-Cas9 systems is basically just a combination uh, of the uh, CRISPR RNA with the tracer RNA complex. Um, and so here's basically a diagram just illustrating on the left what the endogenous system looks like and on the right what it looks like with a single guide RNA. Um, and you can just see that the main difference is that the CRISPR RNA is uh, is is basically uh, concatenated to the tracer RNA. And so here I'm also uh, illustrating to you um, where the PAM sequence sits relative to where the nucleases act. And so you can see the PAM sequence is basically adjacent to where the cuts are made by the two nuclease domains of Cas9, so HNH and uh, RUVC. And so once you once the double-stranded DNA break is induced uh, by the nucleases, um, what then has to happen is basically uh, double-stranded DNA break uh, has to be repaired. And so there's basically two, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's two repair pathways that are typically used. Um, one is the non-homologous end joining pathway and the other is uh, the homology directed repair. And which one gets used basically uh, amounts to whether or not you provide uh, like a donor template. And so if you have no donor template, then basically what happens is the non-homologous end joining pathway is used to repair the break. And uh, basically what happens is that non-homologous end joining is, a imprecise, uh, break, is, is an imprecise mechanism for uh, fixing the DNA double-stranded break. And so what happens is that when the ends are joined, uh, typically some kind of disruption happens, like you'll have like random insertions or deletions or uh, reading frame shifts or so on. Um, for the purposes of genome editing, typically you want to provide a donor template. And so in uh, when you provide a donor template, basically what happens is that you have uh, in your flanking five prime and three prime ends uh, of your donor template, you have uh, sequences which are uh, basically similar or exact to the region around the cut that you want to make. And basically through homology directed repair, uh, your donor template gets essentially integrated into the genome. And so whatever you put between the flanking sequences also gets integrated. And so in that sense, you can, for example, easily do some kind of insertion. Um, or if you want, depending on how you uh, use your CRISPR-Cas9 system, you can do deletions, insertions, or whatnot. And so in the basic form of CRISPR-Cas9, you use a single guide RNA to bring the Cas9 complex to the target sequence of interest. And basically a double-stranded break occurs uh, due to the pair of nuclease domains. And so one of the problems that we'll talk about later in this lecture are that sometimes you can get off-target effects. So you can have double-stranded DNA breaks occur at regions that are other than the target sequence that you had in mind.
And so one way to deal with uh, the kind of off-target effects of CRISPR-Cas9 are to actually design the system to require two guide RNAs, two distinct guide RNAs, uh, to act on kind of neighboring regions of the target, target sequence in order to kind of increase specificity. And so here the idea is that what you can do is you can create uh, Cas9-based NICases. And so the idea is that uh, your Cas9 complex has a pair of uh, nucleases. And so what you can do is you can engineer two different Cas9 mutants, where in each mutant you pick one of the nucleases and you introduce a silencing mutation that makes it a nuclease null mutant. And so the idea then is that you can design two guide RNAs uh, that kind of flank the region of interest. And basically, each guide RNA will bring a different Cas9 mutant in close proximity. And what will happen is that you'll introduce uh, a double-stranded DNA break, but it won't happen at the exact same location. Uh, basically, they'll be offset by the amount dictated by your two guide RNAs. Um, but basically, the point here is that the homology-directed repair will only occur when the two uh, guide RNAs are basically acting on proximal regions of the genome. And so in doing so, it increases the specificity of the cut. So as I mentioned earlier, the CRISPR-Cas systems are pretty prevalent across the archaea and bacteria. Um, and so that means even for effector uh, Cas proteins like Cas9, uh, there's many orthologs that you can find across different bacteria, for example. And so uh, it turns out that um, different orthologs of Cas9 uh, have different PAM sequences. And so here's a list of um, examples of different Cas9s, uh, as well as their different relative size uh, in terms of number of amino acids, as well as their PAM sequences. Um, and so it's just worth pointing out that uh, although uh, the Streptococcus pyogenes uh, version of Cas9, SP Cas9, uh, was the original one that was uh, used and is the one that's pretty prevalent uh, nowadays, even nowadays, um, there are many different orthologs of Cas9 that you could choose and uh, they have different benefits. Um, and so one of the nice things about the original uh, SP Cas9 is that uh, the PAM sequence is relatively short and so the PAM sequence is NGG. Um, and what that means is that, uh, the sh generally speaking, the shorter the PAM sequence, the more often it occurs in the genome. And so what that, in, in a given genome, and so what that means is that, you know, because you need the PAM sequence there in order for the cut to happen, then that means that, you know, the more often it happens, the more often your PAM sequence happens uh, in the genome, the more places that you're able to make a cut. Um, so uh, we won't talk about it in detail here in this lecture, but there's been a lot of work on not only kind of characterizing, uh, you know, the recognition sequences and properties of different Cas9s or other Cas uh, effector uh, proteins, but also on actually engineering uh, or mutagenizing uh, Cas9s in order to, for example, make them smaller, uh, which makes it easier, for example, uh, in terms of delivery into cells. Uh, people have also tried to engineer Cas9s to have less off-target effects, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and also it turns out that the uh, endogenous SP Cas9 um, sometimes randomly mutagenizes uh, similar target sequences in a genome. And so some people have tried to engineer variants of Cas9 that don't uh, randomly mutagenize your genome. And so it's worth also pointing out that up to now I've basically described PAM sequences is basically uh, sequences that must be present on the genome adjacent to the region that is going to be cut. And so it's worth pointing out that uh, PAM sequences are not, uh, don't always have like 100% specificity. And so what I mean by that is that um, certain effector uh, nucleases might cut at um, multiple PAM sequences. And so just like how we drew in the um, in the review lecture, you can kind of characterize the PAM sequence or this you know set of sequences that a particular Cas protein recognizes as like one of these sequence logos, where uh, each position of the PAM sequence is represented by a column, and the size of the letter at a particular column basically describes something like the preference of uh, the Cas protein for. Uh, 
seeing a base at that particular position in the PAM sequence. And so the point here is that you can see that um, for positions uh, one and two for this particular Cas protein, um, you know, while there's a preference for a T in positions one and two, uh, it's also being known to recognize uh, Cs at those positions as well. And so one of the challenges of working with Cas9 as well as uh, a number of the other Cas effector proteins as well is that they basically have, an, you know, there's it's well documented that they have off-target effects and so they can cut non-specifically. And so even though, for example, you might design a guide RNA that, you know, uses a, you know, highly specific protospacer, it turns out that uh, Cas9 can still cut at regions of the genome that can differ from that protospacer by as much as like five bases. And so, um, yeah, depending on what kind of sequence you're trying to target, um, a difference of like five bases can actually get you a lot of off-target effects. Um, Cas9, just like other Cas proteins, might use more than one PAM site. Um, we won't talk a lot about it, and we won't talk about it in this class. But um, you know, there's there's methods for trying to characterize the PAM sites of Cas proteins, and you can see that you know some Cas proteins don't you know they they recognize more than one PAM site easily. Um, and so some of the ways that you can kind of avoid this problem of off target effects is that number one, you can try to target regions that are unique in the genome. So there's few other regions that are kind of similar. And so using some of the techniques we'll talk about in the next lecture on like sequence alignment, you can basically take possible, you know, you can take candidate target sequences and you can search the rest of the genome to see if there's, if your specific candidate target has a lot of potential off target regions elsewhere in the genome. Um, you can also decrease the activity of Cas9 in your cells. And so even though Cas9 can recognize, and other Cas proteins can recognize um, uh, sequences that don't perfectly match the protospacer, um, they tend to do so less frequently. And so if you kind of decrease the overall activity of Cas9, then even though you decrease the activity at your target site, presumably at the off-target sites, the effect is, is even more. And so and that's one way of avoiding off-target effects. And finally, again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, people have been trying to uh, mutagenize Cas9 um, and generate mutants that um, have fewer off-target effects. And so uh, it's briefly worth mentioning that here, um, uh, most of the like, uh, whereas a lot of the genome editing that happens typically is on a relatively small scale, um, you know, you if if you're talking about using like CRISPR-Cas9 to um, fix, for example, like risk variants for certain diseases in cell line models, then oftentimes what you're talking about is just flipping, just introducing single point mutations or small insertions or deletions. Um, but it is worth pointing out that people have figured out how to make larger scale changes using uh, Cas9. And so, for example, in this paper here that you can look up if you're interested in, uh, people have figured out how to use CRISPR-Cas9 to make like, you know, almost a megabase deletions out of the genome. And so, um, you know, just be aware that, uh, you know, CRISPR-Cas9 is fairly flexible. And so you can make, you know, big changes to your genome if you, if you really do experiments carefully. Um, and so I briefly mentioned that uh, there are type one, or sorry, class one systems uh, that can edit RNA. And so Cas13 is just an example of an RNA nucleus system where basically you can target and make edits to RNA instead of DNA. And so some of the applications you uh, could use this kind of system like Cas13 for R, for example, uh, you could basically transiently modify gene expression and so if you want to turn down genes in a kind of a transient way, um, you know, you could use something like Cas13 instead of having to, uh, instead of trying to change the genome in order to modify gene expression patterns.